All right, I think we can get started. Uh, thank you all for joining us for today's Lunchtime Art Talk, which as many of you know, is a weekly series led by Hammer curators on works from our collection. This series will focus on artists featured in Made in LA, a version. Free reservations to visit the Hammer are now available. Visit our website to reserve your time to see our biennial now open at the Hammer Museum and the Huntington Library and the Botanical Gardens. Um, my name is Erin Cristobal. I'm the Associate Curator at the Hammer Museum, and I will be facilitating this afternoon's talk on Alexandra Noel. After the presentation, I'll be able to answer all your questions. And just a few Zoom notes before we begin. Uh, when the presentation starts, please select speaker view in the top right corner of your screen. And in the top middle of your screen, please click on view options to ensure side by side and fit to window are checked. Um, please note that today's program is being recorded. You have the option to toggle your camera on and off using the camera icon in the bottom left corner. Um, whatever you're most comfortable with. Um, you will remain on mute until the end of the presentation, at which point I will unmute those who have questions. Uh, during the presentation, if you have any questions for me, including any technical issues, you can ask those using the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. Okay, let's get into it. Um, can we pull up the first slide, please? Um, and for those who are looking at the empty bookshelf behind me, uh, I just moved into a new office. So yes, I promise I'm a curator. Yes, I promise I'm an intellectual. And yes, I promise you I have a book collection and I read. Um, so let's get into Alexandra Noel. Um, so as I mentioned, Alexandra is in the current iteration of Made in LA that's currently at the Hammer and uh, the Huntington. And um, I was really intrigued by Noelle's work because it I hadn't seen the work before, but um, obviously I think something that I was immediately struck by was the small scale of the work. And this installation image kind of gives you a sense of how small these works are in the gallery. Um, you know, and I would say they're some of the smallest works in the show actually. Um, so I think this thing happens um, as a viewer, which I think is what Noelle is intending to do, which is as soon as you witness this very small grouping of paintings, you're immediately sort of drawn in, I think in the way that you would sort of encounter a screen perhaps or a tablet, right? And you really want to like, you know, get this sort of, you, you sort of um, enter this intimate space with the works in which you're sort of, you know, reviewing the details of the work, um, seeing if there are any connections between these groupings. And, you know, ultimately I think what this grouping does, uh, which Noel uh, refers to as a family, which I think is really interesting considering some of the themes throughout her work, which we'll get into, um, is that you're actually sort of confronted with this sort of um, sculptural mass, right? Even though these paintings are, um, you know, in some cases as small as a cell phone, um, together they sort of collectively present as this mass. And not only this mass, but this sort of sprawl that's happening, this taking up of space in the gallery that I find really fascinating. Um, you know, I think um, in our current sort of state of the art world, where um, particularly with painters, uh, where scale sort of is a measure of value, I really appreciate that Noelle is sort of refusing that um, and focusing, um, honoring, I think, this, this longstanding tradition of small scale painting. Um, I think that uh, there are a few artists that come to mind, painters in particular, 
um, when I witness Noel's work that I want to speak to um, certain artists that are definitely favorites of mine or certain encounters that I've had. Um, and I really appreciate that Noel is sort of a part of this larger legacy. Um, one of the first artists that I'll mention is Leonora Carrington, um, who was a surrealist um, who was British born, um, but is Mexican and was also not only a painter, but a novelist. And I think this is really interesting considering uh, Noel is also a writer. Um, we can go to the next slide. And, um, you know, I think there's something that happens in terms of Noel's work where um, there's sort of a clear um, sort of transition or interlocking between her writing practice and her painting practice. Um, and Noel in particular is really invested in film, really invested in the cinematic realm. And you can really see that sort of come out in the works here. Um, I was particularly drawn to this triptych, um, which is at, I believe, the Huntington, Ifs Eternally in Blue, which is very small. And as you can see here, there's sort of this very intimate scene. You're, you're sort of inside of a womb, right, with a fetus, and then you're confronted with this very sort of abstracted belly button, perhaps, and then this sort of abstraction of um, this train in the middle of the night. Um, and, you know, your mind does this thing where it's sort of trying to put together these three sort of seemingly disparate um, images. Um, and I think there's something to that because I think, um, you know, when you are writing for film, when you're working on scripts, or even when you're writing for theater, right, you're often writing in a very formulaic way. Um, oftentimes there's this sort of three part act that's playing out. And I love the way in which Noel sort of visually renders this formulaic way of writing, as you can see here. Um, this particular triptych actually brought me back to one of my favorite um, art experiences, which we'll go to the next slide. We'll go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, which was actually uh, Noah Davis's last show when he was with us in 2013 at Tilton Gallery. Um, this piece is called Stacked Cubicles, My Last Art Fair, in which you see these three very small works sort of installed in this environment. And what was really fascinating about this environment is that you would essentially step into it and um, these would all, these walls would sort of silence the rest of the gallery around you. So not only were you, again, sort of confronted with this very intimate womb-like scene or, you know, sort of on the precipice of birth, but you were sort of, uh, there's also this silence around you. Um, and so I love the way in which Noel's work also evokes the sort of same feeling and really brought me back to this moment. Um, we'll go to the next slide. Um, what I really like about Noel's work as well, and I think specifically, um, you know, this show is that when Noel was thinking about this idea that there would be a grouping of paintings at both the Hammer and the Huntington, uh, she was really thinking about the concept of family, the concept of sisterhood, um, and thinking about both of these spaces as sister spaces, um, spaces that could elicit a sort of deja vu. If you're encountering the works at the Hammer, the works at the Huntington look very similar, but they're slightly off. So thinking about genetics and how siblings sort of render in different ways, um, 
And I really liked this concept and you really see it sort of play out in the works. Um, this piece in particular, I was drawn to called Circumcision 2020, um, which I think is, is sort of based off of a conversation that Noel had around the concept of circumcision. Um, and I think that it's a really interesting, um, you know, surgical procedure that happens often that isn't necessarily discussed in our society. Um, and for me, I think it brought up all of these notions around, you know, what does it mean to be circumcised and how does that play into sort of patriarchy or these sort of modes of masculinity that uh, so many of us subscribe to. Um, and so when I was thinking in that way, uh, it actually brought me to, next slide, um, Forrest Bess's work. Um, and, you know, again, Forrest Bess is someone who is also working at a very small scale. Uh, this piece is called Untitled the Crown. As you can see, this sort of um, phallic-like object is emerging from this landscape with a crown here. And, you know, you can make all sort of assumptions as to what Bess is referring to. Um, but, you know, I saw this very... Um, interesting conversation happening between Noel's work and Bess's work. Um, what's interesting about Bess uh, is that, you know, Bess was um, a painter, but also a fisherman and was sort of discovered in a way. Um, Bess was obsessed with the idea of what they referred to as visions um, in which they would paint their visions, which were often, you know, abstract or really focused on symbology. And Bess was also very invested in um, the sort of desire to merge the masculine and the feminine together. This was sort of an ongoing pursuit of Bess's. And um, it actually manifested itself through Bess in which Bess performed a surgery on themselves um, to, you know, um, in hopes of sort of um, encapsulating or embodying this sort of masculine feminine uh, dynamic. And so I couldn't help but think about um, how these procedures, um, I think, especially when they happen around certain anatomy, um, elicit all of these questions and themes around masculinity, femininity, but also queerness, transness, um, and this ultimate desire to sort of um, either transcend or submit to a prescribed sexuality. Um, we'll go to the next slide. Uh, so as I mentioned, um, Noel is very invested in cinema and we had a really great conversation the other day just about film. Um, one of the things I love about Noel's work is when I was encountering the work, you know, there is these tropes of tragedy that sort of underpin the work, you know, um, either as you see here, the sort of crying woman or, um, you know, moments that feel like loss, um, even, you know, sort of listening to the loss of a child or stillborn child um, and how that sort of has a ripple effect on a family unit. Um, but I think also there's this sort of um, innate humor that's underlying the work. And we had a long conversation around this sort of, um, this tension between the tragic tragic and the comedic um, and how they potentially work together and thinking through um, certain genres of film. And we both kind of settled on, um, you know, all of these iconic movies from the early 90s. Um, we'll go to the next slide. Um, like Twister, for example, um, or Jurassic Park, or Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. You know, these really actually strange movies that were like highly, um, you know, playful, imaginative, um, innovative at the time, right? Because the early 90s is kind of the onset of, you know, the digital realm. And so we see, you um, 
you know, these films utilizing uh, these sort of new modes of CGI. Um, you know, there's the iconic moment in Twister where we see the cow getting sucked into um, the tornado. And um, so, you know, I, I see so much of that in Noel's work, sort of playfulness um, uh, and sort of invoking that moment. Um, what I also wanted to mention, and this is something that I mentioned before, is that, you know, as I said, um, Noel is not only a painter, but a writer. So Noel has a writing practice and so much of that practice is actually rooted in, um, you know, writing treatments or scripts. Um, if you have your hands on the Made in LA catalog, uh, Noel actually has a treatment featured in the catalog. And some of these writings actually do segue into um, certain paintings. And so I think that, you know, not only, you you know, would I describe these paintings as surreal or fantastical, but they're often very poetic. Um, you know, again, even though they're small in scale, there's something that really draws you into them. They're very activated. They're often these really, these scenes of turmoil or in-betweenness that you as a viewer have to sort of sit with and think through. Um, and so I just feel like they're they're so uh, fascinating and uh, sort of continue to evolve on the canvas even beyond the completion of the works. Um, uh, I wanted to also speak to the sort of bodily references that you see throughout the work. Um, you know, this was something I was also drawn into. There's oftentimes, um, these portions and parts and cuts of bodies, you know, they're often sort of cropped um, in certain ways. And so you're only sort of left with visually um, a certain aspect of a larger object or a person. And um, that sort of bodily visceral experience for me really invokes um, Sometimes this idea of like food um, or again, the like the guts, um, the organs of the self. And so there, I think there's something really sort of um, salacious perhaps <laughs> um, about the works that I think are, are quite interesting. And, uh, you know, Noelle herself has also alluded to this sort of food um, that oftentimes the works are the, si the size of certain foods um, or pastries or small cakes or cupcakes and things like that. Um, Noelle also talks about the, the idea of, um, I think, cradling the works, which is really interesting. Um, which again sort of brings me back to maybe this more familial space or this desire to um, invoke a certain naivete, um, a certain type of childhood like um, imaginary um, that we see sort of circulate through all of the works. And um, yeah, I think they're great. <laughs> um, and yeah, I. Um, I just really appreciate, again, this sort of two-ness that Noel was really intentional about between the hammer and the Huntington. Um, so to sort of round out uh, my, my talk here, and then we'll get into Q&A, um, the works are just so fascinating um, in the way that they draw you in. And, you know, I think that is a strategy and perhaps in a way sort of pushing against this, this, um, this notion and this real life sensibility of quick looking, you know, oftentimes when we're confronted with these small technological objects, we are quickly looking at something, we're quickly on social media, quickly checking our emails. Um, whereas because these are paintings, um, and because they require a sort of slower looking, um, your mind is actually confronted in a way in which you have to slow down and the slow gaze comes to the forefront or the slow looking comes to the forefront, which I think um, 
is perhaps a lost sort of, I don't know, a lost, I don't know what the word is I'm looking for. Um, but I appreciate that through my engagement with Noel's work in the galleries, um, my mind did slow down. Um, I sat with these works for a long time and it was a reminder that um, the world exists beyond our phones. <laughs> um, so thank you all for joining us today. Um, and we will go into Q&A. Thank you so much. Uh, Charles, you can unmute yourself. You're muted, Charles. Okay. There we go. You got it? Okay. Um, I don't know if mine's a question or an observation, maybe an affirmation of what I uh, think, but it seems that there is a, sort of a common theme in, uh, in uh, uh, 2020 uh, 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 Made in L.A. in that there is more to be thought of or found in what is not there than what is there. Mm. Is, that a, is that a fair observation? That's pretty prolific, Charles. I, I'd have to think <laughs> about that one. I, I agree with you, right, in general. And I think to sort of bring it back to Noel's work, that's definitely there, right? When I speak to this sort of cropping that she's intentionally doing, mm -hmm. get certain parts of body parts or certain parts of objects, your mind is really left wondering with, um, you know, what's on the other side of the canvas or just mm -hmm. off the borders of the canvas. Um, and so your mind does this wandering thing where perhaps it creates its own narrative based on the sort of breadcrumbs that it's given throughout the work. Um, mm -hmm. So I definitely see that manifesting in Noel's work. Thank well, you. I noticed that the, uh, the long piece, that could also be a pillar. And when it's a pillar, you sort of reach up and try to find, you know, what's up there? It's, so, it's sort of like uh, the column that the other artist uh, has in the, in the show, that it uh, holds something there for you to think about as opposed to just being a, uh, a uh, fixture, if you will. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. It's, it's, it, the verticality of that work definitely mimics the pillar by Aria Dean in the same gallery. Yes, yes. In. And beyond that actually mimics the columns and sort of architecture of the Huntington. So there's this larger connection that's happening in that particular gallery. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, I'll push in again. I think the idea of the smallness is really so great. I mean, you can't possibly experience what it must be like to be in the actual museum or in the in the uh, the, sh the display wall because uh, they're tiny. It's like 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 looking at a stamp collection. You know, <laughs> you almost need a uh, a uh, magnifying glass, mm. if you will, to yeah. really Char actually. Uh, grasp what's going on. Yeah, that actually brings me to a point I didn't mention. Thank you for bringing up the stamp collection because something that uh, me and um, Alexandra talked about was that a lot of these works also are sort of in the realm. Ooh, that's my phone. Um, in the realm, realm of this, the scale of um, uh, sort of portraits you would see around the home. Right. So there is this sort of familial domestic theme that's coming through. Um, and oftentimes when you see these sort of family units coming together, they're reminding you of like um, 
like a living room space, right? Where mm -hmm. all of these mm -hmm. portraits are sort of strewn about. Um, and so I think there, there's also some intention in scale there that's sort of this one-to-oneness with a photograph of a portrait. Um, I have a question here from Leo. What gallery at the Huntington is displaying the work? Does it contrast with another artist in their collection? Um, so Leo, the work is in, I um, actually don't know the official names of the two galleries that Made in LA is in at the Huntington, but it's in the, I would say the larger um, gallery space. And while there's no direct, I think, contrast with another artist in their collection, for example, the way in which um, Buck Ellison's photographs are directly referencing um, some of the works that are in the Huntington's collection. Um, I think there are perhaps other more intimate ways in which there are connections being made that you know, I can't immediately think of. Any other questions? Don't be afraid, guys. Also, Ali, I don't want to put you on the spot, but if you'd like to speak, you can. I know Ali's here with us, the artist. Okay. Um, I guess just to sort of rounded out. Um, again, I just wanted to emphasize that I, I really appreciate the this, this small scale tradition of painting. Um, I think it's, it's sort of undervalued uh, in this current art market. And um, yeah, I think there's something there when again, there's this desire for um, painters in particular to scale up um, as a way to sort of increase value or to allude to the fact of some sort of like prolificness when in fact, I would argue that um, all of these individual small works are sort of prolific in their own right and tell these incredible stories. Um, so uh, if you haven't gone to Made in LA, um, highly recommend that you do. Um, and yes, come see both of the shows. Um, again, as Noelle mentioned, she really wanted to invoke this deja vu between the experiences at both the Hammer and the Huntington. Um, and so please come and, and sort of pay close attention and see those connections being made. Um, any last questions before I close it out? Okay, um, thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon and a special thanks to Bank of America for presenting Made in LA 2020 Aversion. To support programs like this and future programs, we invite you to become a Hammer member or donate to the museum by visiting us at hammer.ucla.edu slash support. Um, be sure to join us at the next week's Lunchtime Art Talk where Made in LA 2020 curator Lauren Mackler will present on Made in LA artist Sabrina Tarasoff. Thank you all and have a good Wednesday. <laughs>